Welcome back to the Tinker Shed, everybody. Well, it's early November here in Niagara Falls, and we're starting to see single digits. In fact, we had quite a heavy frost only two days ago to where I had to actually scrape the windows to be able to drive the car around. Now, this has me laser focused on getting my snowmobile ready for the skidoo season, but also helping out my brother-in-law by cleaning his set of TM40 Makunis that go onto his 2003 Legend 500. Now these are a great set of carburetors. His sled is really, really clean and runs really, really well. This is more just a maintenance item, but we're gonna take them apart today, clean all the jets out, inspect all the O-rings and the needle valves, all of that, and then put them back together and deliver them to my brother-in-law so he can get his sled ready to go as well. Okay. Let's take a look at these great set of carburetors. Now the Makuni TM40 has been made for many, many years and it's utilized in both four-stroke and two-stroke engines. It's been used in motorcycles, everything from Harley Davidson's. There's even a DR650 conversion kit that you can buy that supposedly gives marked improvements to the performance of the DR. But today we are going to look at a set of Makunis that came off of a snowmobile. So they're kind of interesting in the fact that they actually have liquid cooled heated galleries to keep the uh, carburetor from icing up in really cold conditions. So I think we'll start by maybe taking the top of the carburetors off and pulling out the internals. I do have to separate these two carburetors in order to boil them in my ultrasonic cleaner. I've never ever broken a set of carburetors apart like this. So today we're going to learn how to do that together. Hopefully it goes really smooth. Okay, let's get to work. I'm gonna use a set of rubber soft jaws here. Now, I would prefer to have aluminum soft jaws. I just don't have a set. And because of this, these are a little bit squishy in the vise. I, I actually just use the regular vise eventually. Now, to get the top off, we have to first remove these two machine screws at the top. And I'm gonna use one of these JIS screwdrivers that looks like a Phillips, but it's not and they fit these Japanese fasteners very, very well. So just make sure that the screw itself has all the dirt cleaned out of it before you start to try to do this. These should come out relatively easily. Now once the fasteners are out, you can just lift the top cap. Now there is a gasket you have to keep an eye on here, but this gives you access to the top. Now in order to raise this up so you can get at the needles in that easier, what a lot of people do is they'll put either a chunk of wood or something inside um, between the idle adjustment and this cam here. But I've got a little bit of a different idea. I usually just do something silly like this. I'll take a zip tie, I'll jam it in. Let's get it through here like this. So I'll jam the zip tie in, bring the zip tie up through here. And then I'll take a second zip tie and run it down like that. That will hold this wide open and allow me to work on it. When I'm done, I just snap this zip tie and this one still remains good. So you sacrifice one zip tie, but for me, it, it seems to work pretty well. Now I'm gonna start by taking the slide out here, but to do that, I need to take the needle out first. So this is, this is what sort of fits down into your main jet and meters out the fuel as you open the slide up. Now to do this, I take out this very small uh, machine screw and I actually use tweezers to get this out. And then there is a retaining clip that I reach in and grab with tweezers. It's like that game operation. Finally, I can pull the needle out and this is made out of aluminum, so it's a little bit tricky. You don't want to bend this taking it out. And you'll see this is a non-adjustable needle on this particular carburetor. It's only got one, one slot at the top. Finally, I'm going to use my tweezers again and pull this small nylon washer out. You do not want to lose this. It's key to getting the metering action proper. Now, as I said, you can take apart the slide from the lever, but for me, I just... 
eventually just took this grub screw out on the bottom and this whole lever assembly comes out when you take the two carburetors apart. So we'll skip ahead a little bit now. Now the next thing I'm going to do is take out the enrichment rod. So this joins the two enrichment plungers, one on each uh, carburetor, and they're held together with these levers and there's also a third lever where the actual choke or enrichment cable comes in. That's this one that I'm loosening off here. Now, this rod has three very distinct uh, detents inside the rod, but basically you loosen off the grub screws and then you can slide the rod out basically onto the one side, keeping track of the small levers as you go. Now, I will caution you as you get to this last little lever here, you want to pay attention because that spring has two little nylon washers, one on either side that you have to keep track of for this to work properly. Once you get all that out, you just throw it into a Ziploc bag or however you like to store your parts and you put it aside so that you can keep track of everything. Next, I'm going to pull out this heater pipe that runs between the two carburetors. Now, this supplies hot water to keep the carburetors from icing up in really, really cold weather. Now, I'm gonna use a screwdriver here and eventually a pair of pliers just to loosen these off of the brass furls that are underneath. These have a tendency to stick and I didn't wanna damage the pipe, so I just took my time and gently loosened things up until I could turn them by hand. Once I get this done, Basically, I can turn my attention to these two cap head bolts that hold the two carburetors together. Now these run from one side of the carburetor all the way to the other, and they run through a pair of aluminum um, spacers, basically. The bolt pulls out, and once you get these two bolts out, the carburetor really is ready to be separated from each other. So I'm just going to grab them and start wiggling them. I'm going to separate first the fuel pipe that's down at the bottom. There's a T-shaped fuel pipe that you're going to see as I wiggle that has to come out. So there it is right there and it's got a pair of O-ring basically gaskets on either side that stop the fuel from leaking. And then finally the heater tube, I twist this off by hand and separate the carburetors. Now after this the only thing holding these together is the main throttle shaft that runs between the two of them. And this just gently slides out um, and frees up both the slide and that lever assembly that we looked at earlier. I'm just going to come in here and snap off this return spring for, for the throttle valve, or the throttle rod, sorry. And then I'm going to gently slide it out of the other carburetor. And you'll see that all of the parts fall off up here. There's a small spacer on the one side, but eventually the rod comes out and this allows you to pull both the slide and the slide lever out of the top. And again, I eventually realized I should have just left everything together here instead of breaking it all apart. But out comes the slide box itself here. Now I just note the orientation of how it goes in this little sort of semicircle here faces the front. And then I get to work on breaking all of the bracketry off of the carburetors. Again, I want to put these through my ultrasonic cleaner. So I'm going to break off all the bracketry to clean up. Now I'm going to, now I'm going to pull out the, um, the mixture screw here. But first I'm going to count how many turns out it is. Now in this case, it's one and a half turns out from a just a gentle stop here and then I can undo it and take the whole screw right out but be aware that there's a there's a washer and a small o-ring gasket at the base so when you finally take this out you want to be looking for those two parts so you don't lose them they're really important if you don't have that seal around there it's going to allow air to enter into the carburetor it's going to be really hard to get this thing to run right Next, I'm going to go around and sort of pull out any O-rings gently with a pick. I don't want these to run through the ultrasonic. And also, I'm going to pull out the enrichment plungers themselves just to have a look at them. And obviously, I don't want these in the, uh, in the bath either. This one looks really good. There's no scoring on the brass cylinder. And the sort of ceiling surface there is in nice condition. 
everything looks really good and the other one looked just about exactly the same. So there's a couple vacuum caps I'm going to take off here that hide a vent and I believe a small adjustment screw. I'm just going to wiggle these off here. And there's also this little o-ring hiding under this brass cap and this was around to seal uh, the top of the throttle rod that comes through. This one looks in really good condition. I think I can reuse it without too much problems. The next step really is to take off the front face of the carburetor and it's held in place with four machine screws that again I'm going to use this GIS screwdriver to pull these out and they came out relatively easy. Once that's done, I can pull off the front cover and it reveals this very complex O-ring. Now, this one seemed to be in good shape. I'm going to reuse it. These are expensive to buy and they seem to be in a kit. You can't just buy this one individual piece, or at least I couldn't find a supplier for it. So I'm gently going to use a pick and pull this thing out and set it aside for very safekeeping. And overall, the internals of this look very clean. There's not a lot of corrosion. There's not a lot of deposits, and even on the front face, the slide box looks really good too. So I'm going to turn my attention to the bottom of the carburetor now. To get the float bowl off, I first have to take this small retaining screw. Now some people don't put this back in, but I believe what this is for is to hold the bowl on so you can change the main jet without taking the bowl off. You'll see here, when I use this 17mm wrench to take this main nut off, the main jet sits right underneath there. So I believe if you didn't have that small screw, the bowl would fall off if you're just trying to change the main jet. Now the floats on these are non-adjustable to my knowledge. It's a one piece unit that has the float, has the needle valve, and it has the seat all built into one. So it's, it's convenient in the fact that you don't have to adjust it, but you have to replace the entire assembly if you want to uh, change things. So I'm going to use, take these two uh, machine screws out of here and you're going to notice that they actually have a little bit of blue Loctite on the bottom so when I reassemble it I'll make sure to add a little bit. I'll take the second one out and then it's just a matter of walking out this entire assembly. Now to do this I just get a small bladed screwdriver and gently pry up on each side slowly walking this assembly out. And you'll see that it sits in a sort of a little recess here and it has an o-ring that seals it so that the fuel only comes through the metering hole on the bottom of the assembly and you'll see that right here when i tip it up right there there's where your fuel comes in okay i'll set this aside i'll pull out the main jet um, this one I think is a 6mm or a 9mm, I can't quite remember, but it's in very good shape, it's nice and clean, and I'll use a steel flat bladed screwdriver to pull the pilot uh, jet out here. It sits down inside this tube. You need to have a good quality screwdriver to take this out. It's very easy to mangle these soft brass jets if you're not careful. The hardest part for me was getting it out, I had to take it out of the vise and sort of give it a little shake, and, and there it is. Again, both very, very clean. This, this carburetor is in very good shape. And you'll notice I have everything laid out so I can keep it organized, but I only took one carburetor apart at a time so that if I wasn't quite sure how to put it back together, I always had the other one to take a look at. So I'm going to load everything into the ultrasonic cleaner here. I use a, a mix of 50% Simply Green and 50% water in my ultrasonic. And it's interesting, I had a, a little bit of problems in the next part of the video that uh, was new to me. But anyway, I put it on about 50 degrees and let it bubble. These things really are handy. And while it's bubbling away, I take this opportunity to clean up all of the small bracketry, things like the idle adjustment screw that was all kind of caked up. I took it over to the wire wheel, took all of the corrosion off, and I think it looks a lot better once I got it all cleaned up. But there are a lot of small parts that you can clean up. I used a small stainless steel brush in my Dremel here. Went through and cleaned up all the fuel intakes. Took any rust off. 
and even any kind of oxidization or corrosion that was on the spigot here for the intake of the carburetor. I just ground all this away before I actually put it through the ultrasonic. And even here, the, the enrichment rod, I just take a little bit of scotch Bright, polish that up. And all of the jets, I take a, a welding torch tip cleaner, take the smallest one I can find to fit through and knock out any junk that might be inside these jets. These ones, again, were very, very, very clean. There really wasn't any need to do this, but it uh, it's good practice. And I'll rinse these off with a little bit of carburetor cleaner as well once they come out of the ultrasonic. And I think that's pretty good. Looks like uh, looks like we're just about ready to go to the next step. So when these parts come out of the ultrasonic, um, it's important to rinse these very, very well. Um, so I take them downstairs and I put them through the laundry tub and rinse them in warm water for about 10 minutes or so to make sure that I get everything off. And then I follow that up with some compressed air. Now I probably should have a glove on here. Compressed air can be dangerous, but I want to make sure I get all of the water and any possible Simply Green out of any of the galleries or any of the jets that, that is in there. So I just gently boil those down like that. So I ran this through my ultrasonic cleaner and have a look at the color difference when it came out. I'm not really 100% sure why it did this. It's the first time I've ever put anything through the ultrasonic where the color actually changed. Now, I noticed I can easily buff that off, but it does have that sort of darker gray look to it. I'm going to have to do a little bit of reading and make sure that um, the cleaner that I'm using isn't going to damage that aluminum. Okay, I've been doing some reading, and apparently Simply Green can be used with aluminum, but it should not exceed 10 minute soak times. So I actually put this in for 20 minutes, and it discolored it. So I'm only going to use this one for 10 minutes or less. The carbs really weren't all that dirty. You can see it clean, cleaned up really well, but I don't want that discoloration on the carburetors. Okay, let's keep going. Once all the small parts are done cleaning in the ultrasonic, it's time to start getting ready to assemble this thing. Now I was going to throw in this plug here, but I decided I didn't want to turn it all gray, so I left it out. So I start reassembly by putting back in the main jet and ultimately the, uh, the pilot jet as well. So as I said earlier, make sure not to over tighten these things. It's really easy to damage these small jets and you don't want to do that. Sometimes they're really hard to get out if you strip out the, the actual um, flat bladed area on them. Next I'm going to use a little bit of white lithium grease here. And I'm just going to add that to the O-ring of the float. I'm going to press this down gently with my fingers, trying to center it to make sure it's going down straight. And as I said before, this little guy needs a, some blue Loctite on here. This is medium strength, so it's not permanent, meaning you don't have to heat it to get it out. So I'll apply a little bit of this to the threads, and then I'll just gently set them in place. And then I'll start to walk them down. So I like to do a little bit at a time here. Being plastic or nylon, whatever this thing is, I don't want to tighten one side too far without going back over and, and tightening it back down on the other side so that it actually seats down into that hole relatively square. Once I can get the actual float back down and seated properly, then I'll come back in and give them a little bit of a snug just to tighten them up. This doesn't have to be super, super strong just snug. Finally I'm going to take the, the uh, carburetor body and flip it right side up and place the float bowl on it. Now I find this is the easiest way to keep the gasket in place. Next I'm going to reinstall that small screw that holds the float bowl on and finally I'll put on the large nut that holds the float bowl in place to stop it from leaking and I'll tighten it down with a 17 millimeter wrench. Now, to get this O-ring in place on the front face, it's challenging. You want to be really careful it sits in the grooves so that it doesn't deform that O-ring when you go to tighten it up. So take your time, sort of place the front cover back on, make sure that it is exactly the way you want it, 
and then you can put back in these small machine screws. I'm going to run these up again with that GIS screwdriver. Now I had one of my subscribers introduce me to the GIS screwdriver and it is really much better than a Phillips, especially on Japanese tools like this. It's what it's designed to do or Japanese parts. So I highly encourage you to look into it and uh, maybe eventually I'll do a little video on these screwdrivers. Now I'm going to put back in the mixture screw. I'm going to thread it in by hand until it just gently bottoms out. Then I'm going to make note of the orientation and for this one I'm going to back it out one and a half turns. And these steel screwdrivers are nice because they have a little arrow on them that tells you where the orientation of the blade is. It's just a matter of putting back in the enrichment plungers. And these also have a nylon cap nut on them. So you really don't want to over tighten these either. Just snug them down. I put a little drop of 3-in-1 oil on there. I don't know if I'm supposed to do this or not, but I don't think it's going to hurt anything. Next, I put all the bracketry back on. Again, I just snug these down. I don't really have any kind of torque rating for them, but uh, you can see they look a lot better. They're nice and clean now. We're going to now put in the slide assembly and you can see I assembled this on the workbench. I thought it would be a little bit easier. I don't know how you do it otherwise. But you can see here that I've oriented the slide box the same way that it came out. And I've also put back in the needle valve here, the small little washer and that small cap head screw to hold everything together. Now, if you choose to assemble it, you can see Makuni first puts in these small uh, springs. That's what holds initially holds this together. They follow this with a pair of brass tie straps. And then on the slide box studs themselves, they put these two small nylon washers and follow that up with the E-clips. Now, I don't know how you get the E-clips in if the slide is in place, so it made way more sense to put it on the bench. Now, Interestingly, the top studs here have room for both a nylon washer and an E-clip, but they don't use them. So next I'm going to lubricate the throttle shaft, and I'm going to also lubricate a little bit in the brass journal inside the upper part of the carburetor. I don't know if I'm supposed to do this or not, but I did. And then I'm going to wiggle and insert the throttle rod making sure to get that small nylon spacer that came out of there in place. And then you basically just wiggle it across. Now you want to make sure, um, one thing I did learn was I actually put the grub screw in eventually to hold it in place so that the throttle slide didn't bind up. But then I could follow up with the second carb and look at this, I forgot to even put the, the, the slide uh, lever on at all the first time. So I filmed all this and then I had to come back and take it all apart. Um, and you can see here I've got it in place. So once I get it in place like this, I want to make sure that the, the actual throttle rod moves and it does. So you just kind of guide the tube on for the heater and the throttle uh, fuel pipe as well to make sure everything lines up. Now. I'm going to use my little zip, try, zip tie trick here again. And you can see I've got the main sort of carburetor in place. Now I'm going to actually use the grub screw and this eccentric nut on the top of the secondary slide lever here. Now keep, keep a note of this because you're going to need to use this to adjust the slide opening between the two carburetors. Okay. Now I can put them back together using the long bolts. I'll just tighten everything up. Uh, I'm going to follow this up by reinstalling the enrichment rod. Again, you can see the little nylon washers. And see the detents? There's three distinct detents on the rod that help you make sure that everything's all lined up. So once you get the rod in place and the small levers in, 
I wiggle the levers to make sure they're centered in those detents. And I just lightly tighten them up until I get all three of them in place. Once that's done, I'll come back in and I'll snug these down. Now again, you don't want to strip these out. You just want to make sure that they're not going to move. So you give them a little bit of a, a little tight in there. The only thing left now is to adjust the two slides to make sure they're the same height when at idle. So to do this, I'm going to use a three millimeter drill bit and I'm going to put the shank underneath the slide here. So I'm going to use the idle adjustment screw until that drill bit just barely fits underneath. Basically a bore gauge. Now on the secondary carburetor, I'm going to use that eccentric nut at the top here. So by turning the eccentric nut, not the Phillips or the GIS screw head, you can independently adjust the slide height on the secondary carb. You can see me doing that right here. Now I'm just going to turn that until I can just fit that shank of that three millimeter drill bit through and then I'll lock down that grub screw. Now you can adjust your idle adjustment once it's on the on the snowmobile and the carbs should be relatively synced. Well, that wraps up today's video on these Makuni TM40 snowmobile carburetors. This was a really fun project and I'm pretty confident that my brother-in-law is going to have a lot of fun putting these things down to the powder this winter. Now, as I said earlier, I've never actually had to take one of these completely apart. I've always just had the float bowls off, cleaned out the jets, the float bowl, the uh, float itself, all that kind of assembly. But it really wasn't as hard as I thought. I took a lot of pictures, I took my time, and I also only did one carburetor at a time so I could always go back and take a look at how the other one was put together to make sure that I got all of the screws and the brackets into the right place. So I hope this inspires you to get out into your shop and take on something that maybe you haven't done before. It's a little bit scary, it's a little bit challenging, but it's a lot of fun. So until next time, I'm Dino. I hope to see you stopping by soon here on Dino's Tinker Shed. Bye for now.